The Oxfordshire ore making industry has been going for more than a hundred years, collars for over 80 years. But where did it all begin? What of the people who lived and loved the craft? From the rowing clubs, schools and colleges, to the Olympic medalists, the story of the ore makers caught the imagination of two volunteers working at the Museum Resource Centre at Stan Lake in Oxfordshire. When a donation of a rowing oar was made to the museum, their curiosity got the better of them. And there was only one thing to do, follow the trail to where their research led them. This oar was donated to the Museum Resource Centre in Oxfordshire in 2012 by Mrs Susan Graves. It was made by her father, Ron Cousins, and as we had the toolbox already, this is part of the same collection. She also donated her school project to us, which was what my dad did for a living. The craft is one of the oldest trades in the world and can be traced back to primitive man. When man first made his boat or raft, he used a bow of a tree for movement, either to push very much like the modern day pont or pole, or to waggle it from side to side, so as the water movement gave a paddle-like appearance. I think what I remember first of all was mainly when my mum used to go to work and uh, of course there was no one at home to look after me so he, he would take me to work with him and he'd put me, make me sit in the corner so I was out of the way but I could still see everything that was going on and watch what they were doing. We were particularly interested in the label on the oar, it says F Collar. Uh, who was F Collar? And it led to discoveries about the oar making business in Oxfordshire. While Susan Graves' school assignment gave information about her father, Ron Cousins and his craft, Roger and Caroline were making their own discoveries about Ron Cousins' boss. Well, we discovered that uh, Frank Collar um, was born in 1902 and in 1932 he started business as an ore maker and skull maker in Oxford. Caroline and Roger also discovered that Frank Collar had not started his career as an ore maker, but as an accountant. In order to find out more, they decided to pay the Oxfordshire History Centre a visit. Um, we've discovered that Frank Collar, his father and his grandfather all became ore and skull makers. His father was a master ore and skull maker, so no wonder he continued in the business. It was something he knew a great deal about and possibly he could see a future in it. I think he, it was his passion. I don't, I don't think accountancy was really what he wanted to do. It was his passion to be an ore and skull maker, to get back on the river. Here it is. More surprises were in store for Caroline and Roger when a photograph of T. Tim's boathouse was discovered amongst the archive. This information would now offer them a trail to the properties and location where Frank Collar started his business. From his humble beginnings at Salter's Boatyard to T. Tim's University Boathouse where he would be joined by the young Ron Cousins. Um, as far as we're aware, Frank Collar started his business in a corner of Salter's Boatyard, but within months he'd moved slightly down the river and come to T. Tim's Boathouse, which is an old university boathouse. Um, obviously his orders increased and he needed the space. Within months of Frank Collar starting his new career, the business was ready to expand. His father, Bill Collar, joined him and he took on his first apprentice, Bill Scoldwell. Thanks to a war office contract, an extra site was required and Collars continued to develop at Jubilee Terrace. Collars would also recruit in 1941 the fresh-faced 14-year-old apprentice Ron Cousins. So uh, it's obviously been redeveloped, but uh, a fire that uh, took hold in T-Tims in the early 60s uh, meant that they had to move out of there and they had this Jubilee Terrace as a, as a stopgap. 
the oral history has told us that the, um, Ron Cousins had to take a break in his training of apprenticeship because he had to go and do his three years national service during the war. But he did come back to Frank Collar and finish his apprenticeship after he'd done his military service. Well, they were fortunate enough to pick up a military contract to provide pedals for the life rafts uh, for the Navy and the Air Force. Uh, because of the demise of uh, T. Tim's boatyard with the fire and uh, this particular property here at uh, Jubilee Terrace not being uh, large enough for the amount of orders that were coming in, they looked for another premise and one came up opposite uh, Hinksy Church which was called Isis Works and that's where they moved to. The skill of making a racing oar, which my father now specialises, is a far cry from the early man's efforts. The timber is Sitka spruce, or more commonly known today. Uh, he, he helped me a lot with that, I think. He, he did sort of, he wrote lots of notes and we went through it and then um, he drew the pictures and explained what they were. And then I would sit and rewrite it in my language or as best as I could in my language with sort of... Um, but as he did give me quite a bit of help, <laughs> I will admit that. <laughs> well, this is a toolbox that um, Ronnie Cousins donated a few years ago to the museum services. And um, we know from Ron's oral history, Ron's father had to provide him with a basic toolkit of about, I think it cost about £10. And we've got special planes that are shaped so that you can shape the ore. You've also got a spoke shave and there's a draw knife in here as well. Ron Cousins left Collars in 1977 and became the Merton and Worcester University boatman. In 1983, Frank Collar died. The business continued with John Collar and Bill Scoldwell. Um, I like woodwork, and I like the fact that uh, we're looking at a craft that has existed since 1932, and it's still going today. And the fact that with these basic tools, a craftsman could create 10 full-size oars in a week. And I think that's fantastic. I'm really principally interested in the social history behind it, about the men who made the business, about the entrepreneurs and craftsmen, together making a very successful business that played from Oxford onto a world stage and keeps going today. Collars did play onto a world stage, being part of Olympic history from 1948 to 1972, with many countries using the collar oars. Uh, the BBC decided to make um, a programme called Burton Dickey, which was about Burt Bushnell, Bushnell and Dickie Burnell and the, the Olympic Games and the double skulls gold that they won in 1948. Collars were asked by the BBC to make replicas of uh, these oars um, so they could use them in the programme. Well, looking at the label on the oar with Frank Collar, I googled Frank Collar just to see what would come up, and it's taken me to a company called Freeland Yacht Spars Limited, which are based in Dorchester on Thames, just outside Abingdon. The Collar business was sold in 1993 to Bossom's Boatyard Binsey in Oxford. Jeremy Freeland, later to become the owner of Freeland Yacht Spars Limited would work at Boston's Boatyard with John Collar and Richard Moran. Jeremy Freeland purchased the business in 2002. They are still making quality oars today and Caroline and Roger were eager to see the authenticity that was required for the BBC drama Bert and Dickie. These actual oars for the BBC. Yeah. Yes. These were actually obviously made when they were making the film Bert and Dickie. Yeah. And obviously we had to, you know, they came to us wanting an oar which is authentic to the period when it, you know, the 1940s. Oar making in Oxford has always been a success because of the uh, this close connection with the Oxford University and the rowing and the, the schools around here that are very. Um, 
very high up in the rowing tables. And you know, it's how how collars started. You know, back in the thirties, was actually making oars for one of the Oxford University crews, which then built um, and turned into a very profitable business in the fifties and sixties. Once collars was established, it was very hard for a competition to come in and actually um, overtake it because it had such a grip. The company had such a grip on the marketplace in the fact that you know the oars were winning top events and they became you know the must-have all. My previous oar making history started really um, down at, uh, at Bosnes Boatyard. Um, I came into the company in the late 90s. Um, at the time there were two people working on the collar business and I, was, I came in to actually uh, take charge of it which was a, quite a steep learning curve. Well I came into this, this industry by accident really. Um, I wasn't trained as in boat building. Um, my background is in musical instrument making and it was really a case of um, finding a job in the Oxford area and uh, I was lucky enough to be given the job and I liked it so much that I wanted to to develop it personally, put more effort into it and become become good at the job. It's a traditional way of working. It's remained practically the same since I've been doing this, which is 12 years now. It hasn't really changed because we the way that it was done when the company was first started, it, uh, we're still using those same techniques and those same tools effectively. Some of the tools may have changed. We've gone from you know, wooden spoke shapes to metal spoke shapes, wooden planes to metal planes, but we're still using the same techniques. He loved the feel of wood and the smell of wood and he would like to go and visit arboretums just to, to see the trees and, and, and smell the, the pine and all that sort of thing and he loved anything made of wood and he's, I say he's passed that on to me and I love just running my hands over I've got several wooden ornaments and I would buy plenty more if I could. I just love to just stand in a shop and just run my hand over anything wooden it's just got that feel and um, I married a carpenter, so... <laughs> We've always specialised in what we do best. We don't try and uh, you know, develop other areas and go too high into architecture or flagpoles, although we all do this. We really specialise in what uh, the main um, product, which is oars and now yacht masts, which are very much hand in hand with their production techniques and materials and it's just really focusing and staying true to our heart. I was trained by John Collar and I started working at the company as a trainee at the very bottom and I had to learn by my mistakes really which is a very good way of learning how to do things to be honest. The, the training was very um, hands-on thrown, thrown in at the deep end with um, items of wood and uh, things to make. When I train people up I obviously have to look at the trainee and their background and any skills that they have. Um, obviously somebody who comes to me who, who is an experienced woodworker will progress at a different rate to somebody who has never held a, a jack plane before. I would expect it to take around four years for somebody starting from scratch to be fully competent and confident. But usually after about, depending on the on the trainee, six months to a year, they, they can be beginning to shape, shape and awe. Hand on my heart, I think there'd always be a marketplace of wooden wooden oars. Um, they're not going to enter back into competition or anything like that, but there's the beauty of a wooden oar is that it can be spokely made and it, we can make oars to particular weight and balance and feel which you just can't get 
with a carbon fibre tube. I think definitely over the years that there have been technological developments in our making which have threatened wooden ores, but there's still a call there for traditional wooden ores. He used to say that when he got the job down at Merton and Worcester, he'd gone into retirement, <laughs> even though he was still working. He was re doing a retirement job that he thoroughly enjoyed. And he said, um, not many people get the chance to punk to work every day. My dad was a, a craftsman. Uh, he, he was a great source, I think, of inspiration to, to lots of young people. We had no idea when we started the research what a journey it was going to take us on. And it's been a fasc fascinating uh, history of ore making in Oxfordshire that we've discovered. Just goes to show that behind every single object there's a story waiting to be told. <laughs>